Yay. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. My name is Heather Lynn. Pronouns are she, they. Grateful to welcome you here in this space this evening. We, uh, that is the first of two gathering songs because the Global Branch is here with us tonight. So let's give them a shout out. Um, we love you, Global Branch. Feel free to share the live stream and invite more folks to worship with us tonight on this beautiful Christmas Eve. As we gather in this space, feel free to sing along for this next song or make yourself more comfy, cozy. Help yourself to a cozy beverage in the back corner there, coffee or hot chocolate. If you're here for the very first time, we would love to hear from you on the newcomer cards around the room on little clipboards if you'd like to share your information there and then put it... Uh, Let's see, we're not taking offering tonight, so where should they put the newcomer cards? In the, in the, back, in the back at the end. In the blue bag? Okay, awesome. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, thank you, Paula. All right, so uh, I think we are ready to sing together our first carol of the night. Again, make yourself comfortable and... Um, Feel free to join your voices to this beautiful old song.
Thank you, Heather Lynn. Yeah. Are you ready for the season? I think so. Yeah, I mean, since you know, like tomorrow is Christmas, probably a good idea yeah, to yeah. be ready by now. Yeah. Are yeah. you ready? Do you feel ready? Ah, uh, okay. sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm as ready as I'm gonna be. So I mean, all of my it. family is like in New York. <laughs> And so, like, yeah, it's it's a different year for me. We're all getting together next Wednesday, cool. and that'll be back here, yeah. which will be marvelous. Traditionally, that's still Christmas. That's still Christmas, yeah. like right up through January seventh. Yeah, we could talk like this a long time and just bore the you and I are tears good out of them. Banter. Yeah, we could yeah. do that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paula Williams. I'm one of the pastors here. Every service here, we begin with the words, "I'm going to speak to you now." No need to try to repeat these with me. Just listen to them, if you will. We start all of our services with these words. Married, divorced, and single here. It's one family that mingles here. Conservative and liberal here. We've all got to give a little here. Big and small here. There's room for us all here. Doubt and belief here. We all can receive here. LGBTQ and straight here. There is no hate here. Woman, non-binary, and man here. Everyone can here. Whatever your grace here, whatever your race here, for all of us grace here, in imitation of the ridiculous love Almighty God has for each of us and all of us, let us live and love without labels. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. And now let's hear the story of Christmas. And our first reader tonight will be Bren McKay. Bren. Yay. About that time, Emperor Augustus gave orders for the names of all the people to be listed in record books. These first records were made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to go to their own hometown to be listed. So Joseph had to leave Nazareth in Galilee and go to Bethlehem in Judea. Long ago, Bethlehem had been King David's hometown, and Joseph went there because he was from David's family. Mary was engaged to Joseph and traveled with him to Bethlehem. She was soon going to have a baby, and while they were there, she gave birth to her firstborn son. She dressed him in baby clothes and laid him on a bed of hay because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke 2, 8 through 15. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. 
This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. Luke chapter 2, verses 16 through 20. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. Thank you.
Isaiah chapter 9, 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this.
Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is so written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. When they had heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced excitingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So I remember well what I wanted when I was 11 years old for Christmas. I wanted a new bicycle. And that morning I got up and I ran downstairs and there it was a J.C. Higgins 26-inch tank survivor. That's right, that's what the bicycle was called. We are talking the 1960s, after all. And I was so excited to have that bike. It actually had a speedometer on it. It also had a light in the front. It had saddlebags, and it had streamers coming out of the handlebars. I loved that bike. That Christmas, I was very, very happy. My dad kept that bike for years and years, kept it in pristine shape. And when he passed, I asked my older brother, I said, so the bike, where's the bike? And my brother said, uh, I, I don't know, which was his way of saying to me he'd gotten rid of the bike. I was just looking for a picture of the bike yesterday because I wanted to put it on my blog post that I put out today at paulastonewilliams.com, which I don't think I've ever told any of you that I actually have that. So there's a picture of the bike, right? I mean, it looks exactly like my bike. And the picture said the person was selling it for $999. I want to have a conversation with my brother. <laughs> that bike made me happy. Do you ever notice that happiness comes exactly when you expect it? You get a bicycle for Christmas, you're happy. You get a raise, you're happy. You get a bonus at Christmas time, you're happy. You go on vacation, you're happy. Happiness comes pretty much exactly when you expect it. Joy has a mind of its own. It was the late 1990s. I was running a significantly sized nonprofit in New York City. It was, in fact, Christmas Eve, and I was not sure we were going to end the year in the black. In fact, I had no idea how we were going to make payroll the following week. We had 135 employees at that point in time. And I was terrified, frightened. It was late in the afternoon on Christmas Eve. I was sitting there with our CFO. What are we going to do? Where's the money going to come from? We'd run out of options. And her mother came in, our CFO's mother, and she brought with her a Christmas rum cake, a true Italian Christmas rum cake, heavy on the rum. And she said, this is for you. And so I just took a little tiny bit of it from the bottom and ate it. And oh, yeah, oh, that made me feel better. I took it home. Kathy took a little tiny bite. Oh, she said, yeah, this, this is Christmas dinner dessert. So we covered it with plastic and then pushed it on a paper plate to the back of the counter, and then we went to bed. 
Next morning, Kathy got up about six o'clock, went downstairs, came back and said, yeah, we've got a bit of a problem in the kitchen. Lily, our golden retriever and border collie mix, has eaten the entire rum cake. <laughs> Whole thing? Oh yeah, entire thing. She might be inebriated, I'm not sure. She, in fact, has pushed the paper plate beneath the refrigerator, trying to hide the evidence. <laughs> I went downstairs, and Kathy had banished Lily out the back door. It was the first really cold day of December, and she is leaning against the glass of the sliding glass door, shivering, literally shivering. And I had no sympathy for her whatsoever. <laughs> I went over and looked out that door, and I said, so? You're cold, are you? Shivering, are you? That's because every ounce of circulation you've got that could be warming your extremities is instead digesting my rum cake. <laughs> and I left her there. My kids all got up, came running downstairs, going down to the family room to open their gifts, and they saw Lily out the door, and how can you open Christmas gifts when there's a dog to be warmed? So they opened the door, brought her in, took her up to Jaina's room where all three children got in bed with the dog. Now it's important to note my children at the time were between 16 and 20. We're not talking little tiny kids. And they are all in the bed with the blankets pulled up to their necks and Lily is in the middle of it with the biggest dog grin you've ever seen in her life. She ate the Christmas rum cake and she was getting all the love she had to give. That's all I remember about that Christmas. Not another thing. I know we ended the year in the black because we ended the year in the black for 25 years straight. So I know we ended that year in the black. I have no idea how we got there. What I remember is that moment of pure joy. As fear turned to wonder, at the closeness of our family and the pure joy of a very full dog on Christmas morning. Happiness comes where you expect it. Joy has a mind of its own. The shepherds were terrified when the angel spoke to them and more terrified when an entire host of angels started singing. They were filled with terror. Terror and fear are often elements of joy. In scripture, over and over, the first element of joy is ironically fear. From their fear, they were then invited to go and see the Christ. And when they saw the Christ, what was the feeling they had there? The feeling was pure wonder. Joy replaced by wonder, which then was replaced by gratitude as they did exactly what the angels had requested them to do to go and tell everyone what they had seen. Fear, coupled with wonder, coupled with gratitude, is the alchemy that produces joy. Bernie Brown says joy is a deep spiritual connection connected to gratitude. So there were the kings, not kings really, just wise men, magi from Persia. They were Zoroastrian religious leaders. Zoroastrianism was, in fact, another primarily monotheistic religion, sometimes polytheistic, but they had a rather unique teaching that also agreed with the teaching of Jesus later on, that every individual's freedom should be treasured, that there was no greater moral good than to protect the freedom of the individual, and they knew that the individual's responsibility was to choose good over evil. They had a sense that there was a child to be born. They followed a star. And from the east, they traveled into Israel. And then they got into the city of Jerusalem, and they met there the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, the representative of Palestine, the Roman king. They told him what was going to happen, that there was a king that they were going to see, probably about two years old at that time. And the second they said it, they knew they'd made a huge mistake. Because King Herod said, oh, well, certainly we need to worship that king. Oh, come back and tell me exactly where you have found him. And when he said that, their feeling was sheer, utter terror. 
fear shivers down their spine. They knew they had made a huge mistake in telling this man what they had come to do. But then they went on and found Jesus with his parents. And watching that two-year-old toddler, they were filled with complete and utter wonder. And with gratitude, they brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And with great joy, they proclaimed the truth of what they had seen. The king had come. Yet one more time, the true alchemy of joy, fear, followed by wonder, followed by gratitude, followed by being surprised by joy. So Paula has brought us from the shepherd's wonder at the angels bending near the earth to herald the birth of Christ, all the way to the Magi journeying from far off lands by the light of a bright new star. But I want to turn our attention to the quieter stars of tonight's story, Mary and the baby Jesus. I want to scope us all the way down from angels and starlight to a barn and a birth, a baby and a mother. As I was contemplating my words for you tonight, there was the title of a book that kept kind of coming up in my heart, trying to weave itself into this message. The name of the book is, There Is No Me Without You. It is also the story of innocent babies born into a broken world. And the title, well, it could be the title of Mary and Jesus's story of tonight. The story of Mary giving birth to the incarnate God, the story of God's own human creation. But before we dive into that, I want you to travel back in time briefly with me about 18 years ago to the night that I gave birth to my daughter, Elle. The coming of Elle into the world was a mix of hope and waiting. 14 full days after she was expected into the world, Elle made her entrance screaming as soon as she drew her first breath. And the nurse placed her on my chest. Her little eyes were screwed shut, and she was in a loud, wailing protest over having arrived into her human experience. And in that instant, I went from sweaty and shaky and spent to absolutely flooded with wonder. And I leaned in close, and I whispered to this wailing bundle, hey, Elle, I'm your mom. And on a dime, at the sound of my voice, she stopped crying. And her big blue eyes flew open, and they locked with mine with a look that very clearly and with great relief said, oh, it's you. I know you. And I just beheld her, thinking, God and I created this precious girl. And, and Jesse, too. <laughs> <laughs> but God and I. Fast forward five and a half years, and we get to a quick second memory. In this one, Jesse and I are walking up a narrow flight of stairs at an orphanage halfway around the world, about to meet our son, Beck. We were led into a nursery that had about eight cribs in it, and over one of the cribs was a picture of me and Jesse and Elle that we had sent months before, and in that crib was our son. As Baby Beck was handed to me by his caregiver, he turned and he saw my face, and his eyes went wide, and his little hands reached out and grabbed my shirt. And his face held the exact same expression as Elle's did on the night that she was born. Except that instead of hearing my voice in utero for nine months, he'd been staring at my picture. And that look said, oh, it's you. I know you. And I just beheld him sitting in this miracle and mystery that it was this unexpected journey to this strange place, to this specific child that would complete our family. With both of my children, the title of that book is true. There is no me without you. 
And what I mean by that is that the experience of becoming their mother fundamentally changed me. It expanded me. It made me into who I am. And it formed how I walk through this world now. So that brings me to Mary and Jesus and what this night must have been like for them. About Mary's long trip to Bethlehem, away from her family and all that she knew. About giving birth in that strange room amongst the straw and the animals and the associated mess. She was sweaty and spent and exhilarated being handed that extraordinary baby to hold for the very first time. And I imagine her beholding the baby Jesus, and I imagine her murmuring in wonder, God and I created you. And in that moment, I also imagine that deep within that baby, God's eternal soul answered her, yes, Mary, and I created you for this. And right there, the circle of creation, it closed. There is no me without you. There is no Mary without God. There is no incarnate God for us without Mary. So on this night, our creator was created by his own creation. Where once Mary was just a young girl, the story of tonight is also her creation story, the creation story of our blessed mother shaped by her experience as Jesus' mother and also as the singular witness to the incarnate God from his first breath to his very last. Do you ever tell yourself the age old lie that you are separate from God? We all do sometimes. I think it's a favorite human narrative, especially when times are tough and we feel alone. Well, I ask you tonight to dwell with me in this moment in history, where the gap that we tend to like to imagine exists between God and ourselves, between God and God's understanding of us and what we go through, was closed, and in closing, became ever-widening. We know how we were changed by the coming of God into the world, right? It's another case of there is no me without you. There is no us. There is no left-hand church. There is no wider Christian church without the coming of Jesus. But we prefer to think of our God as unchangeable and unmovable. And yet if we read closely, we see in scripture that God is moved by man again and again. In Deuteronomy, we comically see God asked Moses to leave God alone and not speak on behalf of the humans, lest Moses change God's heart from anger to mercy, which of course Moses goes ahead and does anyway. And God's heart was moved and mercy follows. So dare we even begin to imagine how God might have been moved and changed by God's own human experience. So on this night, when we celebrate the birth of the Christ child, we're also called to remember the full span of our God's human life. Most of what I know of God is from reading about how God moved through his human experience. As one who blazed a risky path of extravagant love and passionate mercy, a maker of miracles, a healer of the broken, a temple shaker, a table turner, a rule breaker, a risk taker, the author and the finisher of my faith. So from tonight's remembered birth story, I'm gonna ask you to travel with me in our hearts to a night some 33 short years later, the night before Jesus would be put to death. A night when he gathered together with his friends and followers to celebrate the annual Passover feast. At this meal, Jesus knew that the end of his human experience with his friends was very near. He had foretold it some three times to his closest friends and followers, and yet still they did not understand what was about to happen. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper was ended, he took the cup of wine, 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And he said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of a new covenant, a promise for the redemption of all people. Do this in remembrance of me. And so tonight, we invite you to come forward to join us in this remembrance of a remarkable human life, which we celebrate as having begun on this night 2,022 years ago. For those of you who are visiting us tonight, please know this church's communion table is one that is open to all people. Everyone without exception is invited to come forward and receive the bread and gluten-free crackers and grape juice, which for us represent the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And if you choose not to commune with us tonight, that is okay too. You are welcome to remain seated. Paula will be off to my right if you would prefer a short prayer. There's also a bank of candles in the back if you would like to light one in prayer. And there you will also find a prayer journal, which our pastors do read and pray for throughout the week if you'd like to write down a prayer request. And if you're joining us virtually tonight, please take whatever elements you have at home and consider sharing what they are in the comments. And for those of you who are in person with us today, please come forward as you're ready to eat this bread and drink this blood in remembrance of Jesus and all that his life and death represent for all of us here. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to serve.
I'm going to lead us into our final candle lighting carol with a poem. If you picked up a candle on the way in, that's awesome. If you didn't, don't worry, we're going to pass out some more right now. As we begin our closing hymn of Silent Night, the candles will be lit at the end of each aisle. And then we'll ask you to light the candle of the person next to you, and so on and so on, until we're lit up in here like a sky full of stars. And to remind us that the light and love that we carry inside of ourselves changes the world for good in more ways than we can ever know, I'm going to lead us into this with a poem called Dead Stars by Ada Limon. Out here, there's a bowing, even the trees are doing. Winter's icy hand at the back of all of us. Black bark, slick yellow leaves, a kind of stillness that feels so mute, it's almost in a whole other year. I am a hearth of spider these days, a nest of trying. We point out the stars that make Orion as we take out the trash, the rolling containers, a song of suburban thunder. It's almost romantic as we adjust the waxy blue recycling bin until you say, man, we should really learn some new constellations. And it's true. We keep forgetting about Antilla and Centaurus, Draco, Lacerta, Hydra, Lyra, and Lynx. But mostly, we're forgetting that we're dead stars too. My mouth is full of dust, and I wish to reclaim the rising to lean into this spotlight of a streetlight with you towards what's larger within us, towards how we were born. Look, we're not unspectacular things. We've come this far. We've survived this much. What would happen if we decided to survive more, to love harder? What if we stood up with our synapses and our flesh and said no? no to the rising tide, stood for the many mute mouths of the sea and of the land, what would happen if we used our bodies to bargain for the safety of others, for the safety of the earth, if we declared this a clean night, if we stopped being terrified, if we launched our demands into the sky, made ourselves so big that people could point to us with the arrows that they like to make in their minds, rolling their trash bins out, after all of this is over.
Thank you so much for joining with us tonight. We want to remind you we do not have services tomorrow, nor the 1st of July when we have or the first. Well, no, the 1st of July, we probably will have services. The 1st of January, we will not have services. The next time we'll meet, we'll be at 5 o'clock on Sunday, January 8th here together because we want all of our people, including our staff, to be able to truly enjoy this holiday season. As you leave, we'll ask you to leave your candles in one of the um, bowls that are designated out there for them. And then also, one of our uh, dear Global Branch leaders, Dee Bramblett, has provided us with a lot of little packages of myrrh and frankincense and stone crosses because she couldn't send gold. And so we would love for you to go ahead and take one of those. I think Toby will have those in the back and you can go ahead and take those also in the back. Uh, on the left are two offering bags. If you'd like to leave an offering with the church, uh, you may do so uh, as you go out tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. And now our benediction. You must learn one thing. You must learn one thing. The world was made to be free in. You must give up all other worlds except the one to which you belong. Sometimes it takes darkness and the sweet confinement of a silent night to let you know that anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. Go in the joy and the presence of Christ. Merry Christmas.